Hi, I'm Josh Jackson. Welcome to What Do You Love, a new series that we're doing here at Paste Magazine. Uh, today, our guest is author Patrick Rothfuss. Welcome, Patrick. Hey there. Thank you so much for coming in. As I was just saying, we, we just did a best um, fantasy novels of the 21st century, and um, Wise Man's, I'm sorry, um, Name of the Wind came in at number one. Wise Man's Fear was also a top 20. Um, uh, so congratulations on that. That's, uh, that's pretty flattering to hear. Um, I kind of, I, I, as, as much as that warms my bitter old heart, part of me, part of me starts thinking of all my favorite books. And then I realize that a lot of them are before the 20th century. And so in retrospect, yeah, that makes sense. I should be number one. <laughs> hey, Best yeah. book of this century well, makes total they, sense to me. You still got 82 years to get knocked off oh, of that Oh, no, spot, see, it's but... King of the Mountain now. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a bad place to be in. So the format of, of this video series, what we're doing is, is allowing people that we love to talk about things that they love. And uh, we thought we would start out um, uh, with, since we do a lot of uh, drinks coverage at Paste, on something that you love, the beverage. And, and you didn't particularly pick this uh, brand of mead, but I did dig in a little bit and saw that you are a home brewer and that you've made your own mead. And I thought uh, we could get going with I'll, I'll try anything Carol's once. mead. Sweet honey wine. Um, just, just to be honest, I prefer to be honest in, in all things. Um, to call me a home brewer is to really overstate it. I did, the truth is I like bottles and I like uh -huh. mixing things together because I used to be a chemist. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cheers. Cheers. Oh, actually, that's real nice. Oh, good. Um, or rather, I like it, mm -hmm. which might mean that it's not good meat at all, ah. because um, I'm not much of a drinker, mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of a problem when you're a, a home brewer. Um, I looked into, like, I bought a bunch of carboys and a bunch of gear and the tubing, and I was, I was getting excited. You know, I had a hygrometer and going to do some science, and and I started reading about it, and that. Beer process is just there's a lot of sparging and fomenting <laughs> and all this all this stuff and and then I was like this I I don't want a part time job I wanted to like do some fun chemistry in my basement mm -hmm. do some mad science and then I thought the Vikings did mead <laughs> they did uh, so I uh, without a hydrometer without probably. yeah and so I actually then I bought a book on mead making and it was even worse. There's like, here's the pH levels, and here's this, and here's how you do the first thing and the second thing. And I'm like, how about I just thump a bunch of honey and stuff into a tub and shake it up, and then we see what happens. And that was the best batch I ever made. Oh, great. Uh, best batch I ever made, and all subsequent batches have been various types of catastrophe because I put too much thought into it. Yeah. So uh, all you at home, Oh, that'd be bad advice. You do, please follow the rules. Don't poison <laughs> yourselves because you thought, oh, Pat Rothfuss said I can make some basement hooch. And then you, uh, uh, you <laughs> give yourself uh, ethanol poisoning. Yeah. Well, every time I've had mead, I'm always struck with just how sweet it is. It this, is a this is a delightfully sweet mead, which is what I really like. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do because... Uh, traditionally, the the yeast wants to eat mm -hmm. all the sugar yeah. and just make it. You end up with a really strong dry mead. Um, this is not dry. No, this is. Uh, it's pretty much. I want everything I drink to taste like Kool Aid. So, <laughs> well, you have a couple picks today of things that you love. Um, what do you want to get started with? Um, there are two books that I have read recently that I've just adored. Um, and I could really legitimately go on and on, uh, but I'll try to keep it as sort of a tight you know, elevator style pitch. Um, the Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Qual just came out recently. I've known about it for ages. I'm a good friend of Mary's. I love her work. And so I was, ex I was excited to read this book. Um, and I also knew she uh, was narrating the audio uh, mm -hmm. Of it because she's a world class audio narrator in her own right, gets hired to do oh, wow. stuff okay, so all the time. A rare double threat there. Oh, it's, I mean, there's only, I can think of perhaps four people 
who can successfully professionally read their own work. There's like David Sedaris, there's Neil Gaiman, and Mary Robinette Kowal, and she's probably better than anyone else because she does not just her book, she does yeah. all books professionally. And so hearing her do her work, it was so nice. The, the, I suppose the elevator pitch, I hate even giving you a taste of it because you just got to get in there and read it. But the basic premise is a meteorite strikes the earth back in the 50s and um, jump starts the space race early mm -hmm. when women had a more pivotal role in effectively computing because mm -hmm. computing was people sitting and doing math and by people it was mostly women. Mm -hmm. The term compute, and anybody who's uh, seen, what was it, uh, Hidden yes, Figures? Hidden Figures, yeah. Um, you know, they the, were the computers. They were computers, that was the yes. job title. And so suddenly you have these computers and they're sort of central to this space race. And this, I was excited about this book and I wanted to read this book and I started to read it and I could not get over how good it was. Mm -hmm. And I knew Mary's a, a great author, and I still couldn't get over how good it was. And in some ways, this is not my sort of book. You know, it's centered in a sort of a modern day. Mm -hmm. It's not secondary world fantasy, no dragons. You know, it's like, yeah. not that that's all I read, but that's sort of where my heart lies. Yeah. And so this is like, kind of in the South, in the 50s, and it's just people talking about math, and I fucking loved it. It blew me away, and I cried a sheet of tears at this book. It is amazing. It's amazing. You have to try it out, folks, and I don't know what you're, don't expect anything. Just walk into it, and you will not be disappointed. Well, I, I uh, downloaded the uh, the sample on, on your recommendation, and uh, so I think I'm three chapters in and cannot wait to uh, read the rest of it. It, it gets its you hands in you really quick. Real quick. Yeah. Real quick. Again, she's such a good writer, and this still blew away all of my expectations. Fantastic. Um, the second one that uh -huh. I brought up was... Uh, uh, called The Murderbot Diaries, mm -hmm. which a friend recommended to me, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm in. I'm in for the <laughs> title. I can use something fun. The world is on fire right now. Please give me The Murderbot Diaries. Let me laugh a little while. And it's a, a little bit more traditional sci-fi set sort of in the future, told from the point of view of Murderbot. And... I have no idea how to pitch this to you guys, except I have, like Mary's books, I immediately went out and I bought um, a dozen copies, you know, and I've given away all but four um, just as gifts to friends mm -hmm. because like people need to read this book. And, um, I, and this is like not bullshitting around. Reading that book has made me a better person. Really? Oh, that's, yeah. that's strong praise. And... Uh, Murderbot, I read, and it's the first time I've ever done this. I constantly, as I was reading it, I was texting the friend who recommended it to me, and I'm like, oh, I love Murderbot. <laughs> like, oh, oh, Murderbot. You know, like, and, and I, I felt such a weird emotional connection with Murderbot, guys. <laughs> Don't read anything into that until you read the book. The nice thing is, I read the audio there too, listen to the audio. And they're very bite-sized, uh, about three and a half hours. And so if you're like, oof, I don't know if I have it in me to start a 13-hour audiobook, come, come try sort of a, a sampler to have this little three-hour story. Come, come on this beautiful ride and, and, and meet Murderbot. It, whatever you're expecting, you're going to be wrong and very pleasantly surprised. So, and, and you're a very avid reader. I, yeah. I'd read that... You pretty much read a, a book a day, would you say? Is that I can easily read a book or two a day, um, especially if I'm traveling or um, if I'm having a depressive episode and I'm trying to pull myself out. Mm -hmm. uh, I read some Terry Pratchett, but uh, yeah, I read a ton. So, so that that says exactly how much uh, these these books have stood out to you. Yeah. If, if you're that avid of a reader, and this is this is your pick, so thank you for that. that yeah. I, I'm always looking for new stuff to read, so. 
uh, I've got a couple couple new ones on the list now. And I'm gonna I'm, he does I'm going off script, folks. Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik also knocked my socks off. Um, if you like fairy tales, you like fantasy, and or if you don't, you just enjoy good writing. Pick it up, pick it up. There, that's and I'll stop. Naomi it Novik is also on our list of uh, oh really best fantasy. So yeah. Um, so you've got you've got a couple books under your belt here, and right now you're working on a or finishing up a, a series that I find fascinating and have not had a chance to read yet. But the uh, Rick and Morty Dungeons and Dragons crossover comic book. How fun was that to work on? You know, pretty fun. Uh, which is not to say that it's been a flawless process. Uh-huh. Turns out uh, writing fewer words, actually much harder. <laughs> um, to say nothing of having like four creative collaborators mm-hmm. and then three editors and two different IP holders that the scripts have to navigate that entire minefield of yeah. collaboration and editorial feedback. It could have been a nightmare, and it wasn't. And I'm, I'm not saying that in sort of the Hollywood, oh, I, I really enjoyed everyone. This has been the best work experience of my life. It, they were very kind to me. This is my maiden voyage into you know, this sort of collaboration on a large scale with known properties. Um, I expect they would tell a different story. Working with me <laughs> is a nightmare. Um, and that's only half a joke. Like, I... I I told them when they approached me, I said, oh boy, I love Rick and Morty. I love D&D. Boy, you don't want to work with me. You know, (laughs) like I will, I will ruin your production schedule. I will bottleneck your process. Find someone else uh, because you will, you will hate me after about three months. And they go, ha ha ha. I'm like, I am being real (laughs) honest with you. I know myself at this point. How has the production schedule been? Oh, I ruined it. Okay. Um, I ruined it. Uh, b- but I warned them. You know, they, they yeah. went into it to it their, with their eyes open. And, but here's the thing. They're professionals. They're, they built in good safeguards because they knew that this was my first time out. They paired me up with Jim Zub as co-writer, and he's just a master of the comic genre. Um, and then on top of that, they were exceedingly kind to me in terms of you know, because I'm like, hey, I know, I know I'm supposed to hit 20 pages. I'm like, what if I need one more page? <laughs> because like to hit like these yeah. good emotional beats that I really need, sometimes you need just like three more panels. And like, there's, you know, it's not like a book or a story where I can add 50 words kind of anywhere. Yeah. You, if, you, if you need an extra panel, that means you need an extra page. And uh, Jim was actually kind of kvetching about it the other day. Where he's like, he's written hundreds of comics and he's working on the Avengers. And, uh, and he's like, he said, you know, one issue, I had to write out 24 characters in one issue. And I had to beg them for an extra page. <laughs> and he goes, Patrick Rothfuss swans into comics. And suddenly they're giving him 24 pages an issue. Um, which, which is very flattering that they would, they would give me uh-huh. enough rope to hang myself with. Um, but then with the extra time for illustration and editorial and coloring, that, that their generosity in letting me tell a little bit of a bigger story um, is really kind of what uh, pushed the production schedule a little. That said, um, I'm, I'm really proud with how it's turned out. Um, and they've given me the freedom to do an extra revision here and there so I can really land the the emotional notes I wanted to hit. Well, well the concept of, of Rick and Morty uh, delving into a real-life Dungeons & Dragons world, just, uh, I, I, can't, I can't wait to, to dig into that. It's, um, it, what, was, what was fun for me is I, um, I said, well, here my pitch, and I, I wrote it up, and it was almost like a, a mission statement, and I'm like, here's the story I want to tell. And I said... People think Rick and Morty is all about ridiculous sci-fi bullshit and ultraviolence. And it's not. Um, It's about, it's the story of a bunch of terribly broken people that are desperately trying to love each other. And people think that D&D is about eating Doritos in a basement 
and uh, killing monsters and getting treasure and then killing more monsters and getting more treasure. And it's not. It's about storytelling. And it's about spending time with friends. And it's about problem solving. And it's about creating narrative, which is a huge thing that people engage in. And interactive narrative is a very rare kind of narrative because most of our narrative is received through TV or music or, or books. We're recipients of narratives mm -hmm. instead of creators of it. And so um, I'm like, what d d is about is friends telling stories together. And I kind of lobbed that up and I'm like, well, this isn't going to fly. They're going to want somebody else. Uh, but they let me tell that story. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, before we go, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you've got a charity event coming up. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of accidentally started a charity about 10 years ago uh, called World Builders. Uh, we rally the geek community mm -hmm. and raise money for various charitable causes. And, um, and then we pass that money along to those causes. Uh, we've worked with um, Mercy Corps mm -hmm. to help out refugees in various parts of the world. Um, when Puerto Rico got hit bad, we worked with Mercy Corps. We did some fundraising for them with the Syrian refugees. We helped out there as well. Uh, we've worked with a charity called First Book that sometimes gets a book here in the U.S. into the hands of a child who has never owned a book before, mm -hmm. which is a concept that like, makes me so angry that I almost can't say it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people out there like that. Our main collaborator is Heifer International, mm -hmm. where they work on helping people all over the world and here in the U.S. Uh, create sustainable solutions for so that they can know where their food is coming from and be in control of their own food supply. It's called uh, food autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so they're education-based and... Uh, for like $120, Heifer will come in and teach a family how to care for a goat, and then they'll give them a goat, and then that family has effectively been given a small business mm -hmm. that produces milk, and then they can sell that for money, and their children get calcium and protein, and then your small business gives birth to other small businesses, and um, and then it grows and grows. Or they work with, they give you chickens, or they... Uh, teach you how to make cheese because your neighbors have goats mm -hmm. or they teach you better farming practices or they give you honeybees. It's tailor-made to the culture and to the ecology of whatever country or city or town that they're in. Mm -hmm. Heifer's been doing it for better than 65 years. They've been changing the world and uh, it's one of the things that I'm proudest of um, uh, is this is going to be our 10th year fundraiser We've raised about eight and a half million dollars over these years, and I want at the end of our tenth year to have raised ten million. Yeah. So, how can our viewers get involved? Um, if you hit our website, worldbuilders.org, uh, the fundraiser itself is starting up on the twenty sixth of November. We're changing the format a little bit, um, so we're running for two weeks. If you come in and you donate, for every ten dollars you donate. You have a chance of winning like books or games donated by publishers, um, game designers. Um, there are auctions where we auction off things um, like uh, read and critiques of manuscripts given by professional editors or science fiction fantasy authors, mm -hmm. rare books. Um, Neil Gaiman has given us a rare uh, signed version of Stardust from way back in uh -huh. the day. It's this, it's, this absolutely rare book that people keep winning from the fundraiser and then redonating so we can use it again. Oh, wow. It's almost more of a mascot now than anything else. <laughs> but uh, a bunch of cool geeks and, um, and good-hearted, kind people come in and help us make some noise, and then we all come together and we make the world a better place. Well, that's amazing. That's, uh, that's a, a great thing. So yeah. thank you for that. And thank you for coming in here and doing this and giving us your recommendations. And I uh, hope you have a, a wonderful uh, New York Comic Con here. Should be a good time. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye.